questions. Uh, we know it is not without uh, great disappointment and frustration that we heard the news from Boeing this morning that they will permanently cease operations of our uh, 787 production facility and entirely move those jobs to South Carolina. We know about a thousand Washingtonians face job uncertainty as a direct result of this decision, and it creates uncertainty for many, many uh, other employees, including potentially folks in the supply chain of this wonderful airplane. Um, Boeing has said that they remain committed to Puget Sound with their other assembly lines. Now, it should not be lost on us that even in the face of this news that there are still tens of thousands of Boeing employees, probably about 70,000 Boeing employees now, and tens of thousands more throughout our very vigorous aerospace industry. This is a very vigorous industry in our state. And the 787 is one of the best planes ever built, certainly the most fuel efficient as well. But today's news does not instill confidence regarding Boeing's uh, similar decisions going forward in the future of aerospace in our state. And I just want to make clear that people know about our discussions with the Boeing company. In our discussions, which were several, including my staff and myself personally, the Boeing company never asked or suggested to the state of Washington anything that we could do to assure continued production of this airplane. Simply put, we did everything we could to keep this production here. And what we know is, is that the dynamics of our partnership with the Boeing Company uh, to some degree uh, has changed, and we have a fundamental obligation to our taxpayers to consider that. We know that we have the best airplane manufacturing and design personnel, the people who actually do the work, are the best in the world. This is unequivocal by any stretch of the imagination. And we intend to stand up for them and their families and their jobs and the economy and fairness treatment for the taxpayers of the state of Washington. So it is appropriate and fitting to be disappointed in this decision. And particularly, and most importantly, in the fact that the Boeing Company has not even left on the table an option to restart the 787 line in Washington when this market rebounds. This market will rebound. People will fly. People will buy the 787, which is a tremendous airplane. And we will continue to push for that, that when this market rebounds, that so should the jobs. I want to make very clear our position in the state of Washington. When this market comes back, so should these jobs. And we will do everything in our power towards that end, including treating Washington taxpayers fairly. And that obviously includes a hard look at the more than $100 million in tax advantages that are today enjoyed annually by the Boeing company. Now, it, advantageous tax treatment, tax treatment is not the only thing that Washington citizens have done in the pursuit of aerospace in this and Boeing company here. We are continuing to cultivate a talented aerospace workforce through our recent investments in the entire education continuum. And we've created an even stronger pipeline for high-tech roles at Boeing through our core plus aerospace education program. We know that talent is the most important resource of the, anyone in the aerospace industry. And this state has moved heaven and earth to make sure the Boeing Company had that talent. We've made great progress on other investments and infrastructure that help reduce costs for Boeing as well, including investing in transportation with the largest and greenest transportation package in state history. We've worked to restore the Export-Import Bank, which is so important to Boeing's international business. We have worked to strengthen Boeing's supply chain. And we have fostered innovation in everything from advanced manufacturing of composites 
to research and development in artificial intelligence and aviation biofuels. We've done a lot for and with the Boeing Company. and We're going to continue to work with the Boeing Company. But a review of this history suggests we have some thinking to do. Boeing got its start here and has been part of Washington for more than 100 years. I know that this is part of our families. It's certainly a part of my family life over multiple generations. We know it's a cyclical industry, and it's gone through many ups and downs. When you're my age, you've seen ups and downs with the Boeing Company several times throughout the decades. And through those decades, we have remained a leader on aerospace in so many ways. We've led, we're led by a workforce that has nearly six times as many aerospace engineering engineers as the average state. And I look forward to current leadership working to continue to strengthen the partnership we have with that company in all of these regards. And there's a good reason for that. Last year, the Teal Group, one of the top analysis firms in the aerospace and defense industry, rated Washington State the number one place for aerospace, design and manufacturing. That includes the number one ranking in terms of the cost of doing business. This is an important thing. We were ranked number one in the cost of doing business. That means best, not highest. Price Waterhouse Coopers gave us the same ranking. This year, Oxfam said just recently, we are the best place in the United States for working families. Last year, US News and World Report said we're the best place to work and to do business because our economy is booming and because we have strong health care, economy, infrastructure, and we're focused on talent development, as I've talked about. And by the way, there has been some confusion about what tax advantages Boeing still enjoys in our state. In fact, the B&O tax break we suspended earlier this year at Boeing's request was just half of their overall financial uh, advantages that they enjoy. We remain committed to keeping Washington a strong aerospace industry leader, including with the Boeing Company. And I look forward to that work. And we have some work to do. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, Lisa Brown now. Lisa. And I want to also express, of course, that we're disappointed in the news about the 787. And uh, our thoughts are with the, the workers and businesses and families affected that have helped to make it such a successful aircraft. Uh, but I also want to point out that Washington State has been in the forefront of the global aerospace industry for 100 years. And ultimately, we don't see that changing, even with this decision today. And that's because we have uh, such a strong industry statewide with uh, aerospace companies in 33 of our 39 counties, over 1,300 of them. And it's also because we're still strong in emerging sectors, such as space and unmanned aerial systems and electric aviation, uh, championing the innovation here that will uh, be the future of the aerospace industry, but also help lower our carbon footprint. So we have companies like Blue Origin in Kent and SpaceX doing satellite manufacturing in Redmond, MagniX, electric aviation propulsion systems in Everett. And the companies come here because of the factors the governor mentioned, our strong quality workforce, our excellent research institutions, and our tradition of innovation and excellence. Uh, we know that the virus has disrupted nearly every industry with commercial airspace taking a very hard hit. Air, air travel um, is substantially down, but it will come back and we are resilient. And the aerospace sector in Washington State is ultimately still strong. And as we emerge and recover from the pandemic, we look forward to continuing to innovate, continuing to invest in the workforce and in the small businesses that make up much of the supply chain of aerospace and continuing our legacy in aerospace innovation and production. 
Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I would like to give you a little update on our COVID response before I stand for questions. As you know, uh, it's clear that our two-month decline in case numbers appears to have pl plateaued and, and is on an uptick, which is concerning. Uh, we cannot let this virus take off. Uh, take a look at what's happening to our sister state of Wisconsin right now in North Dakota. We've been making great progress. We ought to be proud of that. We're now seeing more schools shift to hybrid learning to bring students back into the classroom. We're seeing businesses reopen. We've been able to reopen bowling alleys and some meeting and, and, and convention activity, wedding parlors, agritourism. We're making real progress, but the long-term out, outlook has to be considered uncertain. And part of this uncertainty is due to the unpredictability of what people will do as the fall comes and people tend to go inside. So I just want to say now is the time to double down on the virus. We've got to continue the basics that we are doing, but with a more comprehensive approach. I'll touch on that in a minute. We've been wearing facial coverings when we go shopping. That's great. Physical distancing and limiting travel and social encounters. But we have to understand that as fall comes, we've got to up our game as we come inside and we're closer and we socialize inside rather than outside. Inside is a much more dangerous environment than outside. Last night, the Department of Health was informed of a large outbreak associated with the student housing on and off campus at the University of Washington. We know of at least 91 cases in this recent outbreak, and it's the second large outbreak since students returned to campus. This has to be very alarming to all of us. We have received strong assurances in the past from the university's administration. I had a meeting with presidents uh, just yesterday or day before yesterday. But it is clear that we need to up our game in these contexts. Now, I understand people are obviously tired during this pandemic. That's pretty clear, something we all share. But we can't allow that fatigue to endanger us. And there is something in general that as we go into the fall, I hope people think about. I think we've done a really good job in the sort of uh, communal spaces, in shopping, you know, walking around, of wearing masks and social distancing. And it is because we've done a good job, because Washingtonians have followed the science, because we haven't looked at this as some ideological badge. It's simply a simple tool to keep other people safe and yourself safe. And because we've done those things, we've knocked this virus down. We're at the top five or 10 states as far as knocking this virus down. These are really great things. But what we've got to learn, I think, is in our, in our homes, in our neighbors' homes, in our relatives' homes, this is a place where we're going to have to figure out how to enjoy our loved ones and, and people as we go inside, which frankly means distancing when you're visiting, which means wearing a mask, even in your friend's home, particularly if you can't distance. These are new art forms, if you will, new habits, new ways of socializing that if we do them, we're going to stay on top of this virus. If we don't, we face real danger. So we will be starting a new PR effort to communicate how to socialize inside that can protect your people you're socializing with because we know it can be done. But we got to give a little thought to that. And I'm hoping people will uh, during this fall. I want to make a comment about our upcoming elections. We are strongly committed to seeing that every voter's valid ballot counts and is counted. Yesterday, I had the honor of leading a group of 11 governors from around the nation affirming our commitment to American democracy and the people's right to a peaceful transition of power every four years, regardless of who wins. The president, unfortunately, deliberately has sought to undermine the institution that is integral to our democracy, and that's voting in elections. His threats to get rid of ballots and his refusal to commit to honoring the outcome of the election, I don't know how to characterize it, but fundamentally un-American. They strike at the very heart of our constitutional form of government. This is the United States of America. Every vote counts. 
And Washington itself has been threatened by this because we have mail-in ballots. By law, uh, embraced by Republicans, Democrats, and independents alike, allow them to be counted after Election Day. Donald Trump is not going to get away from stopping these votes from being counted and depriving Washingtonians of the right to vote. But we have to be vigorous, and I'm again calling on all public officials to call on Donald Trump to cease and desist this effort to take away the right of people to vote in the state of Washington. And we need Republicans to help on this and Democrats. Otherwise, we're going to lose hundreds of thousands of votes that he is going to try, try to stop being counted. And if you note the outrage in my voice, it's because that's what I feel. And I think we all should feel that. So I hope people will pitch in on this effort. Uh, we have something to celebrate today, Jimmy Carter's birthday. Um, he said, we must adjust to changing times and still hold to unchanging principles. And he has certainly been a leader of principle. He has been an early leader in the clean energy revolution. And if we had listened to him decades ago, we'd be in a lot better position than we are now when it comes to clean energy. He turns 96 today. Uh, I know there's many ways we can honor him. I know one of them is to vote, and I hope that everybody will do so. Uh, I have John is John Weisman's available, and also Lisa for your questions. I'll stand for your questions. First question comes from Rachel with AP. Governor, you said that Boeing didn't give you any feedback on what the state could do to get them to keep production here. Based on that lack of communication, how would you describe the current state of the relationship with Boeing moving forward? Well, there was not a lack of communication. We had numerous conversations. I talked to, uh, to Stan Deal on several occasions about this. He's a very gracious individual. Uh, he is a polite individual. And uh, I you know, like him personally in, in my discussions with him. But they were most unproductive because we repeatedly asked, what is there anything we can do to help the Boeing company stay here with the 787 line? And he, he was never able, nor was his staff, to offer any scintilla of suggestion what we could do. That was very frustrating, frankly. And the point I want to make is it is clear to me that the state of Washington has done anything, everything it could do to keep this production going because Boeing never suggested otherwise. Now, if you hear voices blaming regulations, taxes, transportation, training, I can tell you that's bunk because the Boeing company never suggested any improvements that we could make. And, and frankly, we've made a lot of improvements. I've given you a litany of the things we've done to enable the Boeing, to assist the Boeing company to be successful and many, many other aerospace firms. And, and we are going to continue that. So we have, we have open communications with the leadership of the Boeing Company. Uh, they allow civil discussions, but I have expressed my profound disappointment in this decision, particularly in the decision to not recognize that the Boeing Company believes this market is going to come back, in part because it's a fantastic airplane. It's, it's beloved. It's fuel efficient. And people are going to start flying again. We all know that. And the most frustrating part of this is that the Boeing Company has shut the door on any consideration of restarting this line in the place that makes the most efficient airplane in the world with the most effective Boeing manufacturing personnel in the world with the least problems in the world. And that's at this facility. So I think that uh, we will continue to have open communications with leadership. And I hope that they will be productive. And I think that they should be. We should continue to make airplanes, including new airplanes and new models in the state of Washington. But in order to assure that, we have got to have fairness for Washington taxpayers and citizens. And that's why we'll be having some review of this situation uh, financially with this company. Rachel, would you like to ask a follow-up? Yeah, speaking of that review, what will that process look like, or has it already started? And then is there a concern that Boeing will just ship more work out of the state if some of those remaining exemptions are rescinded? No, they won't do that, and they aren't going to do that. I'm very confident of that, because they know they have to make airplanes, and they have to do it in the, in the best place, and they don't have options, frankly, in this regard. So I don't believe that is a risk. Uh, there's a risk that Washingtonians wouldn't be treated fairly, though. 
And I just fundamentally believe, I, you know, these jobs mean a lot to every one of us. Hard-working people, out of work. Maybe a thousand, probably more than that over time, out of work. When it didn't have to happen and it needs to come back, it needs to get fixed. When I see an unfairness, I want to see it get fixed. And this was an unfair situation. After we have extended to the Boeing Company $2.2 billion of tax relief to get this airplane, they then established a second line and now we're eliminating production here and giving us no ability to consider getting it back when this market improves. I cannot in good conscience say that that is fair to the people of the state of Washington. So, you know, we, we just can't roll over and play dead here. There has to be a fairness extended to the people of the state of Washington, and I have a responsibility to stand up for that. So I'm confident that this is going to, uh, I believe over time, help the Boeing Company focus on fairness in its relationship with our state. Now what it looks like, I, I, I will be having conversations with legislators about their thoughts in this regard. I have not made any proposals uh, to date. I'm well aware of their four major tax advantages that they do enjoy. So I'll be doing a lot of listening uh, to legislators and the public in the weeks to come. Next question comes from Jill with the Seattle Times. Governor, who will be uh, leading this review? And, and do you expect it to be done ahead of the legislative session so you can uh, offer proposals to claw back some of the uh, bone tax uh, revenue uh, this session? Uh, well, I would expect that we would have, if, if we are going to make a specific proposal, that it would uh, be encapsulated in our budget, which we would roll out in December. I would assume that if we were going to make a proposal, that it would be in that time frame. And I think we'll be able to have the conversations with legislators by that period of time to make any appropriate uh, decisions. Joe, would you like to ask a follow-up? Yeah, a follow-up question for the governor and the health secretary. There was an Atlantic story, a story in the Atlantic magazine this week, uh, making the argument that uh, when trying to gauge uh, the coronavirus, people are putting too much emphasis on the R not number and not enough on the, I guess what's known as a K number, which is sort of the uh, estimate of its dispersion. And one of these, um, so I'm curious to hear, if the state is tracking that, and, and the article makes the case that contact tracing should be going uh, uh, to trace people backwards to see who infected the, uh, the current subject being discussed rather than forward-looking contact tracing, is the state doing that or are they considering it? John, you want to tackle those? Sure, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, sure, in contact tracing, uh, we actually do ask people where they've been, uh, what their activities were to try and identify, you know, where they may have also um, contracted the virus. That's how we identify outbreaks, uh, frankly, as we um, uh, trace people both back and then, of course, uh, forward in terms of identifying who might have been potentially exposed. So that's all wrapped up into our case and contact investigations and uh, disease outbreaks uh, that we do where we try and actually create um, networks to find out what the actual transmission uh, was so that we can figure out how to best break the, break the cycle. Um, you know, clearly the um, epidemic is based on a number of things, how many people become uh, infected uh, from an individual, how interactive uh, those social networks are. Um, all of those things go into uh, looking at the um, outbreak and what the future course might be. So all of those things are looked at in some of the measures that we um, that we look at. So uh, we try to take a comprehensive approach to this, as we've said from the beginning, not relying on any one particular um, uh, number as our as our sole um, uh, way of, of looking at the outbreak. If I could add something to uh, Rachel's previous question too, I just uh, wanted to add something. Uh, Rachel asks, you know, is there some risk of, of losing the, the the, the 777 line, no, there is not. And one of the reasons is, is in our uh, agreement with uh, the Boeing company, uh, they cannot open a second line. They were essentially did that under the contract that was negotiated before 
uh, I was governor. But in this agreement regarding these tax breaks, uh, they cannot open a second line on the on the 777X. On the 737 production, uh, this is the most efficient system of production, and there's there's no conceivable way the Boeing company is going to be able to move the 737 line. So uh, I don't believe that that's a meaningful risk. Next question comes from Keith with Como. Governor, the eviction moratorium ends October 15th. Are you going to extend the time on that? I, I probably, but we have not made a, a decision on that. So I'll have to get back to you as soon as we do. Keith, would you like to ask a follow-up? Can I ask the secretary this yesterday? The number 75 for 100,000 is your benchmark for returning to school. Some counties are approaching and going above that. Pierce County in particular today has gone to 76%. Would you recommend they stop or put a pause on their in-school learning? John, I don't know if we've said anything specific. Right, so I think, again, we're asking, uh, as I said yesterday, communities to take a look at these numbers to see what makes sense for them. Um, and there are many factors that schools um, have to think about. We have issued uh, really strong, as I think we said yesterday, safety guidelines for schools, some of the strongest we think in the country. And, um, you know, that include the piece of physical distancing and wearing face coverings and, um, uh, you know, screening folks for symptoms, uh, all of which are important uh, uh, to keep our kids safe. Um, we do believe these are local decisions that local folks need to make. Um, our guidelines um, have uh, certainly said, uh, first, we want to think about bringing back our youngest kids to school, given that um, you know, they are the ones who seem to have some of the least effect um, of this virus. And uh, we, we know school districts you know, around the state who are also considering bringing school, uh, kids back to school in a hybrid model, um, even before they reach the 75 per 100,000. Um, we want people having those discussions. We want people considering their individual circumstances. Again, if you have smaller schools, if you have smaller class sizes, you reduce that risk. So we have a lot of um, um, uh, belief in our local health departments and local school boards and administrators and parents who are wrestling with these, and uh, we're here to support them in those decisions. Next question comes from Jerry with the Everett Herald. Governor, you have said that Boeing uh, never asked for anything, but in February and March, they did ask, and uh, they asked uh, you and the legislator to repeal, uh, rescind that tax break so it could deal with the WTO issues, and they asked that it be restored completely when the issues were resolved. But. Uh, you and the lawmakers agreed to rescind, but not fully restore, and you added some new requirements. Do you not think that maybe um, they didn't ask because that was a pretty strong message, and I'm wondering why you didn't um, and, uh, and fulfill their request? I want to make this abundantly clear, and I'm sure Stan will back me up on this if you ask him. We asked the Boeing company on multiple occasions, including in writing, because I wanted to make this very clear, that we asked the Boeing company if there was anything we could do to assure or even more, make more likely that this production facility would stay in the state of Washington. I asked that to Stan several occasions. I wrote him a letter to ask him that question, and we were never given any suggestion whatsoever. Now, that's just clear. It's very unfortunate. It's very disappointing. We want to work with the Boeing company. We want to look for options. And we understand these market conditions that have been so difficult uh, for them. That's very clear. That's why we have not raised our voices when they've had to, uh, to curtail some of their production. We understand that. But we understand also that this market is going to come back. And we understand we have the best workers who are now going to be thrown out of a job and their families out of work. And so we think we're doing the responsible thing. Jerry, would you like to ask a follow-up? What, what yes, I'm pointing, yeah, excuse, Jerry, just excuse me, just a second. What I'm pointing out is the issue you raised never came up in our discussions, either in our conversations with staff, the Department of Commerce, or myself personally. Jerry, your follow-up. 
Yeah, just to clarify, on the, t the current tax laws apply to both Boeing and all the aerospace companies. So are you, as part of the review, looking to see if you have the power to uh, affect only Boeing, or do you imagine the entire aerospace industry will have to, you, your changes would affect all the industry? We want to we want to affect the thinking of the Boeing company management because that's the group that has made these decisions. Next question comes from Essex with Cairo. Yes, Governor, you mentioned that uh, the Boeing company got 2.2 billion in tax breaks on the 787. Are you ready now to commit to getting that money back from Boeing for the taxpayers? Uh, no, I, I have not. First off, I have not made any decisions categorical in any specific dimension of what we should do here. What I've said is we ought to take a hard look at that financial relationship, and that's as far as my thinking has gone. I'm not thinking about it in those terms. What I'm thinking about is fairness, and fairness is we want to bring these jobs back in some meaningful way. And there are still very measurable, you know, tax advantages the company adva has. They have a B&O tax credit for pre-production development. They have a B&O tax credit for property taxes on land and buildings and leases and manufacturing. They have a sales tax exemption for computers used in development design and aerospace services. They have a sales tax exemption for construction of new commercial airplane facilities. Every one of these means that some other taxpayer is going to have to pick up the burden when the Boeing company does not pay those taxes. And we are going to have an increased burden in our state because we're going to have a lot more unemployed people not paying revenues to the state that are going to need some services. So what I'm saying is we need to think in a rational, calm, dispassionate way about a way forward in this relationship. And I'm confident it will continue to be successful and that this, this aerospace industry is going to grow over time in the state of Washington. But while we're doing that, we need a modicum of fairness for Washington taxpayers. And that's my job, to stand up for fairness. And that's what we're doing. Essex, would you like to ask a follow-up? Yes, Governor. Uh, last year, you described uh, going into a room with the Boeing folks and them asking for these tax breaks. And it felt like uh, you were being held up, uh, described it almost as a mugging. Do you think that the Boeing leaders were offended by that description and that somehow affected their decision making here? No, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. I've had civil conversations with Stan Deal, and I want to reiterate, he is a, 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 a very civil, gracious person. Uh, he's done some good jobs at the Boeing company. Their response to the COVID pandemic to keep his workers safe, I think, has been admirable and largely successful. I've expressed that to him. He's got a very difficult job, I understand that. Market conditions have been very, very difficult. And I don't think there's any indication uh, of that. I do, I think people understand that when our state, you know, was threatened to losing one of its iconic industries, unless we came across with 2.2, or excuse me, with billions of dollars, I don't actually know what the number is today. You know, that's more than frustrating. And maybe I expressed that in terms that were not, uh, as genteel as possible, but I certainly felt them at the time. Next question comes from Jim with the spokesman review. Governor, in light of um, the president's uh, suggestion that, that uh, poll watchers go out to polling sites, um, I'm wondering what you're thinking. I, I realize Washington does not have polling sites, but we do have uh, election uh, centers are, uh, on election day where people can go and register and cast ballots. So uh, is there anything that, that, that you are telling election officials around the state to do in, in preparation for some potential uh, uh, trouble? Well, no, I haven't had communication with ele election officials, but I am trying to communicate with leaders in the state of Washington to ask them to stand up against this madness. I'm very serious about this. We need Republican legislators, Republican members of Congress to call President Trump and tell him to knock it off. This is a serious threat to voters. I want to make people sure they understand this. Hundreds of thousands of people are going to vote, both Republicans and Democrats and independents. Today, they have a right, the 
if you mail that uh, ballot in on election day, it's going to count and it's going to get counted. Donald Trump has ex evinced a clear intention and desire to stop those votes from counting and being counted. And it is clear he's going to do everything possible to stop those votes from being counted in my state, in our state. I can't tell you what, how outrageous that is. And I'm asking Republicans particularly to tell Donald Trump that this is not American, it's unconstitutional, it's illegal, and it violates the principles that we have in both parties in the state of Washington. We need everybody to speak up on this. We cannot have a constitutional crisis on our hands if he tries to get away with this. This is not a partisan statement, it's one in favor of voting. And both Republicans and Democrats, votes count, votes count in my book, and they all ought to get counted. So that's what I'm calling for, is for the people who can influence him to stop this, which are mostly Republican elected officials, to stand up on their hind legs and stop this man. Jim, would you like to ask a follow-up? No, that's okay. I'll, I'll pass. Next question comes from Hannes with Cairo Radio. And hi, Governor. Jim, I'm curious. You said that you were confident that you would have a continued good relationship with Boeing business-wise moving forward in the state. Can you explain why? It's because I have uh, uh, a desire to have a very vigorous aerospace industry in the state. I'm confident we can do that. I know we have the best workers in the world that make the best airplanes in the world, bar none, and that there's every reason that that's a mutual interest we have with the Boeing company. But they have to understand that we have a business relationship with them. And when they negotiate to sell an airplane, they negotiate in a way that is responsible to their company. I'm negotiating in a way that is responsible to the citizens of Washington and the taxpayers of Washington and the workers of Washington and the students of Washington, uh, that we have to generate revenues so we can pay for the education of these students. So I think they understand that, that that's the kind of relationship that we have, and I believe it can be productive in the future, but we need the Boeing Company to start to see, show more respect for the taxpayers of the state of Washington and the citizens and the workers. And if we do that, we're all going to be mutually successful. Hannah, would you like to ask a follow-up? Follow-up? Do you have a, an idea what the actual economic impact of this move is going to be on the state at all? I do not. You know, and again, there, there's two parts of this story. Uh, the heartache of a thousand people might be losing their jobs, and, and more probably, because obviously there are people in the supply chain who have uncertainty today as well. But again, I do want to reiterate, we have, you know, 70,000 people just with Boeing and another tens of thousands throughout the supply chain. So we are going to have a vigorous aerospace industry, and we should be, we should be happy about that. But we're, every job counts in our state, and every family counts. That's how, that's how I look at it. But I can't give you a number at the moment. Next question comes from Alexis with the News Tribune. <laughs> Governor, as families prepare for in-person learning in some places, what sort of information should they expect from school districts when cases are diagnosed? Uh, does the state have guidance about what communication there should be in that regard? Well, the diagnosis is largely between the medical uh, profession, but John, do you want to talk about that information transfer? Right, so, um, you know, this is a piece where the local health department does the investigations and works with the school districts and uh, communicates to uh, parents uh, and students as they need to uh, in terms of any potential uh, transmission and when is the right uh, point in time to perhaps ask um, uh, folks to quarantine, et cetera. So some of this is really on a case-by-case -case basis um, as to the exact situation uh, that's being faced uh, at the time. So really we, we rely on our local health folks who are doing the work side-by-side -side with the school districts uh, and the administration there to um, appropriately be transparent uh, with information, uh, in particular making sure also that parents and students have the information they need to keep themselves um, healthy and safe. Alexis, would you like to ask a follow-up? No, oh, thank you. Next question comes from Veronica with KNDU-TV. Veronica? 
Veronica, are you there? Come back to Veronica. Next, we will go to Paige with KUOW. Paige, are you with us? Hello, Governor. Um, you, you really take a very different tone in your statements today than uh, Mayor Franklin of Everett and uh, Executive Summers of Snohomish County did. They took a tone of, of support, understanding, uh, and, and frankly, they characterized your statement this morning as being divisive. I'm wondering how you would uh, respond to that. Well, I think we share a view that we want to support this industry as we have. As a person who has been involved in uh, billions of dollars of tax relief, they have come from me, not those two leaders who I respect and get along with when I've talked to them about this. We have provided plenty of support to the Boeing Company, no question about that, and we'll continue to do so uh, in many, many different ways. Not just taxes. Look, we're going to support this industry in the way we have it so many different ways in education to make sure they have engineers in apprentice, supporting apprenticeships in, in transportation infrastructure and XM band. We're going we're to continue to support this industry in, in so many uh, different ways. We're going to continue to work with the industry and have good communications with them. But I think that, uh, I think that standing up for the state that has given a company $2.2 billion and then lost uh, the jobs when the company knows those jobs are going to come back somewhere because this industry is going to rebound and shuts the door on our conversation with them. Uh, that's just fair. That's just responsibility. I consider that unifying the state of Washington in a position that we want to grow this industry in the state of Washington. And I may note that those are tax breaks that belong to the state of Washington. I love Everett and I love Snohomish County, but this is about the state of Washington's ability to educate our children treat other taxpayers fairly who have to pick up the tax burden when Boeing gets tax advantages. That's a state responsibility. So I'm sure that we are actually unified in our goal, in our support of this company, and we will take care of the taxpayers of the state of Washington because that's my job as governor. Scott, would you like to ask a follow-up? I, I do. Uh, the 787 tax breaks were canceled at Boeing's request. The 777X tax breaks were an extension of those very 787 tax breaks that were found illegal by the World Trade Organization. Uh, what is the status of the 777X breaks? Well, we followed Boeing's request, but I just want to reiterate the four that still exist are the ones that you know deserve consideration. And we have not made any final decisions on that, but uh, I suggest we, we just need to look at this situation. Okay. We're gonna go back and try Paige with KUOW again. Paige, you're unmuted. Still having technical difficulties there, but I have her question. On I, I want to add something. The gentleman asked a question that I think deserves a little better answer. Look, we cannot be a state that is a, just takes orders from any corporation or any company. We just can't. Taxpayers work too hard to pay their taxes. Machinists work too hard making, making these airplanes. We can't be in a position where the companies just dictate to us and we just say, yes, sir, how hard, you know, when they ask us to jump, we say, how high? We can't do that. It's just not fair to our state. So if anyone thinks that's divisive, I would suggest it is responsible to do the fair thing. And I think that's, that's what we're doing here. And if that results in just the tiniest bit of attention to a company that we've had for over 100 years, we're going to work through this. I believe this will be successful over the long term. But this is a two-way street. It is not a one-way street. And we have to have the Boeing Company think in those terms. The next question comes from Paige, who's having technical difficulties, so I will read it out. On elections, is the state talking about preparing for any potential unrest from some residents in the case that Biden's won election? 
Uh, there's, to my knowledge, nothing that's, that's unique to our you know, standard operating procedure. Okay. Next question, we're gonna circle back to Veronica with KNDU. Veronica, are you there? We're gonna move on to Shelby with KAPP. Hello, Governor, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, um, I was going to tie back to the importance of families and jobs in our state. A uh, local business that has been open for 38 years in Kennewick, Washington, recently sent you a letter in regards to how he can reopen his business. Um, he owns a Chuck E. Cheese. And I was wondering if you got that letter and what your response would be for any um, business similar to that that has to reopen or else they will shut down. Well, I, I know you don't expect me to be aware of every letter. I don't know. We'll have to check. If you can share the gentleman's name, we'll check and, and get back to you if, if we can. What I would say is we want to do all we can so we can open up all of these businesses. And that means the more that you and I and everyone else uh, wear a mask when we're at a party and socially distance and maybe avoid some of those, the faster we'll be able to re reopen these businesses. We need to pull together for these businesses. I'm pleased that we've uh, just announced our second round of assistance to small businesses of another $15 million to help some of these small businesses keep their businesses open. And I've met with some of these businesses that have been quite appreciative of that help. It's a small amount, but it's sometimes what means survival to them. We've been able to adopt some protocols that have increased the availability of this, including in the restaurant industry, and we're continuing to look at those. And we're looking at other industries literally on a daily basis. So we're continuing to look for options to bring these businesses to open, and we, and we are hopeful we will continue or reinstitute this downward trend of infection so we continue that reopening process. Shelby, would you like to ask a follow-up? Uh, no, it, it's fine, but I do understand you can't keep track of every single business. Well, you think I remember Chuck E. Cheese's because my law partner used to represent the first Chuck E. Cheese owner in eastern Washington, so you'd think I'd catch that. Next question comes from Justin with Capitol Hill, Seattle. Hi there, Governor. This question is not about Chuck E. Cheese, uh, but as we're, as we're facing the concerns and the, about the increase in the cases this fall, I'm, I'm curious to know, um, what are the discussions that are happening about uh, the possibilities for reopening the process and, and for areas like King County to advance in the COVID phase process? It feels like that kind of discussion has kind of dropped off the table. Well, we have been making progress lately more on a industry by industry. As I've indicated, there has been multiple industries where we've acted to open them up. I listed several of them. Uh, we've sort of been going in that direction. And the reason we've been able to do that is a combination of we have brought some of these numbers down, but we've also developed in combination with the business community that we've worked with protocols to allow them to open safety safely and that continues i think you're going to hear some announcements next week for some other industries in, in this regard uh, the, the phases look the viruses the numbers are what count here and again i you know you sort of hear me say that but we need to knock these numbers down and that means the more people who wear a mask when they go to a family barbecue and socially distance the faster we'll get these numbers down and the faster we'll reopen counties and that's what we can do right now. We can't, I don't think we can ignore this. In Wisconsin today, you have to get an appointment to go into the hospitals, uh, maybe Wisconsin or North Dakota. We're starting to see the explosion in, in several other states of this virus. And they were, these are states that, you know, had low numbers a month ago. So this is just a reality, you know, that we have to, to realize. But as I've said, it's pleasing that we're reopening. We've got some sports activities coming back. We've got some schools in sight coming back. And by the way, I want to again thank educators who've been fantastic, doing the best they can during this remote time. But we want to keep opening schools. Justin, would you like to ask a follow-up? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a, a repetition, but it, I just want to clarify. You, you, you do understand that, say, uh, parents in Seattle um, right now may be looking at some of the counties that really aren't that far away, um, or, or someone who lives on Capitol Hill and seeing the way businesses are open here and, and compared to, say, uh, elsewhere in the state, um, how uh, the frustration may be and the impatience might be building. That, that makes sense to you. And is, is, there, is there something to do that could address that kind of regional issue? Yeah, I have to tell you, it, it is very frustrating to people, and I feel it profoundly. Every business that has to close its door, I feel. These businesses are great people. They've invested their life savings. They've worked. Their family's involved in it. They might have a dream. Look, I feel every, you know, I don't know every one of them, but I know they're out there, and I feel them. And I want to do everything I can to help them out, consistent with not allowing this to ravage our community. So I just want to assure you that I, I recognize that. I also recognize the frustration that things are different from place to place, across county lines. That creates frustration because people might be on two different blocks divided by one county line and the rules are different. That's frustrating. I get that. I'm not sure how we resolve that totally and still have some degree of individualized treatment. We could avoid that frustration by just having one, uh, one phase, one category for the whole state. That would reduce that frustration. But it would mean that areas that have very, very little or no pandemic action could not open up their businesses just to avoid the frustration that you have evinced. We've decided to have a phased approach where certain areas can move forward because they're in better shape. I think that's the right decision, but it does create that frustration you've talked about. And I'm dedicated to reopening these businesses as fast as we can safely. We have time for one more question, and after that we have David Postman on the line who has something to add. The question comes from Veronica, who's having technical issues from KNDU. The health officer at Benton Franklin Health District said last week that state leaders were actively reevaluating the state's reopening metrics. Can you confirm this? And if so, what changes can we expect? We are constantly evaluating these metrics. It's a daily thing. I can't tell you there's been any seismic shift in that, but we are constantly looking if there's a way to adjust any of these metrics based on the new science as it comes in and based on what we're observing on the ground and based on what we're learning from this. And we are learning things. We're learning about treatment. We're learning about what protocols work. We're learning about how to inspire people to wear masks and where they do it. We're learning about where people actually are doing that. So I, I would say this is a constant iterative process. There will be changes in the future, I know, and I can't tell you exactly what they are as we learn more. Now we'll go to David Postman, who has something to add. Thanks for letting me step in for one second. I wanted to clarify two things so I could. Once to, to Jerry's question about the um, bill the legislature passed this year to fix the WTO matter. One, I, uh, uh, Jerry, I think you're uh, misremembering what the bill does. You should look. I think it's deep in Section 3. It talks about after March 31st, 2021. Uh, we can go back to a preferential rate if certain things are met. One of those things is uh, resolution of the WTO issue. Um, and just to be perfectly clear, uh, the bill was negotiated um, with Bob and I, I did that on behalf of the governor and um, I can assure you that there was nothing in that bill. Um, they didn't love it all, but in the end they agreed to it and by no stretch of the imagination is there anything in that bill that they or anybody else would read as a sign of a lack of uh, support for the industry or the company. They uh, were with us on that, and we did not give them the bill they wrote in the first place, but it was a really productive uh, process. And then on, along the same lines, to follow up on Essex, just because, again, I was in the middle of this, um, that bill was negotiated after the governor's comments that you referred to, um, and we actually had the most productive and positive uh, uh, meetings that probably we've had with the company, and that has continued. The governor's uh, spoken about uh, uh, his respect for Stan Deal, and I can tell you, uh, even uh, as late as this morning, they remain civil. And I would say since Stan Deal came into that office, we've had the most open 
uh, relationship with the company in, in our eight years here. Uh, and we really appreciate that. We disagree on some things. They disagree on some things that we've said and done. Um, but it remains very uh, uh, professional and productive and candid, really, at a, at a great level. So the, the, any idea that uh, uh, words said at a, a press conference or something of this sort or history over a bill has led them to make a major financial decision to move uh, uh, final assembly just, just is not uh, uh, true, um, and I, I would expect the company would uh, reaffirm that uh, even though, again, they don't support everything we uh, say or do in the, in the company. So, uh, Jeff, thanks for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. Yeah. I just want to uh, reiterate what David said. Uh, Stan has uh, been very uh, actively interested in opening communications with us, and I've enjoyed that. Uh, during his tenure, and, and I want to credit him for having open communications, and I trust that that, that will continue. Uh, I do want to reiterate on that question, and maybe I've, I've said it three times, at no time whatsoever was that a bill or any of the things around that bill requested changes by the Boeing company during our discussions of the 787 plant. Zero, and I just want to make that clear. Any final words, Governor? No, thank you very much. Uh, please take care of your health. Ask up.